Your Excellency, President Julius Maradio, Excellency, Madam First Lady, Honorable Ministers, Honorable Members of Parliament, Honorable Paramount Chiefs, the Diplomatic Corps, our, rep our representatives of the UN and World Bank Group of agencies, our international partners, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great honor to welcome you to this dialogue on behalf of the Ministries of Environment, Ministries, Minister, Ministry of Energy, Planning, Finance, Local Government, and Agriculture. I welcome you to this dialogue on climate resilience and energy transitions. As you are aware, over the last few weeks, His Excellency the President has launched a number of events related to Feed Salon. We're very confident with the able leadership of the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry that that track is moving and we will soon be dealing with implementation issues. Concurrently, and in the, in the planned sequence, His Excellency the President of the Republic will today launch a critical dialogue. He recognizes that the success of Feed Salon, in fact, the development and growth of the economy will also depend on how much this government tackles climate change issues and, of course, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable energy solutions. So this is the beginning of a dialogue. It is not intended to be the end. And we're very determined to make sure that we benefit from the experiences around the world to make our march successful. Some have been wondering what is the limit of the responsibilities the President has bestowed on the special initiative on climate change, renewable energy, and food security. So briefly allow me to state what we know we have to do. We will provide strategic guidance and support to respective ministries and agencies. We will enhance cooperation among the ministries to ensure policy coherence. We will remove barriers and facilitate project implementation and development. But we will also try to create new opportunities and partnerships with the best institutions to be able to move our economic development and the President's ambition and targets enunciated in his manifesto when he was campaigning. And of course, we will undertake various responsibilities assigned by His Excellency the President. Next slide, please. Our immediate approach, therefore, is very clear. We will set up a secretariat and technical teams to support that effort in collaboration with respective ministries. But more importantly, we will harvest work already done over the last five years or decade. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to harvest what we've already done. So number one, under the leadership of the Minister of Agriculture and Finance, would like to align existing programs and projects to feed Salo. We have nine seasons. We want to make sure we harvest those existing programs while we develop others, but ensure the timely delivery of services. Number two, we want to remove barriers and fast track, and I'll talk a little bit about that. There are a lot of projects and programs that have been conceived by others. Maybe they're stuck because of bureaucratic reasons, political reasons, whatever the barriers are, Mr. President has said, take action, fast track, support the ministers. We will formulate new programs to secure new funding, and that's also part of this dialogue. We've invited here a number of international partners, the President and myself and the ministers have met at the Africa Climate Summit, at the UN Climate Week, and yes, within four weeks, we've been able to mobilize them, and we're very grateful that all of you responded within short notice, because you know we already have the political will from His Excellency, the President. 
And more importantly, we're working closely with the Ministry of Finance to ensure that we establish a credible, strong climate finance unit within the Ministry of Finance. We recognize the President has been very clear that part of our funding must come from the policies we put in place and projects we develop to ensure we crowd in climate finance. Next slide, please. This dialogue, as I said, is the beginning of a process. We're very clear in our minds that during and after this dialogue, we'll be working diligently in a number of work streams. And so this is why we're very happy with the galaxy of partners that are here. It is our intention, under the leadership of the President, to develop policies and programs that will support his five main game changers, building into that kind of resilience. We will initiate the development of a just energy transition plan. We have enough expertise in this room. But we will do in harvesting what has been done by the NCC, harvesting what has been done by the World Bank, the UN, the donors, EU and others, who, who have been working in this space, in climate change, in energy solutions. We want to harvest that. As we discussed with the NCC and others, we don't want analysis paralysis, too many more studies. We are ready for action, we know. Our sector has been studied by the Ministry of Energy and many partners. How do we harvest those and develop a just energy transition plan for this country within the next six months? You need a plan that is clear. That we, there's no, there, there are no quick fixes. The Kenyans who are our guests, I'll talk about them in a minute, will tell you their transition was not overnight. It took time. It was not going to go. So you need a consistent plan for 10, 20 years. And you're very deliberate, regime after regime, to deliver on them. The Ghanaians do not politicize energy. The Kenyans don't know who the one is. They just know they need affordable, reliable energy and they're consistent and they stick to the plan. We will have that plan. The president will have a plan, inshallah, in six months for a little longer. We will work on climate resilient agriculture. We're already collaborating. We see strong collaboration between the two ministers. We're already working on it under the command of the president. We will integrate energy and clean cooking into the plan. This will be one of the first cases where we elevate clean cooking issues at the same level as electrification. In this country, people think that clean cooking problems are women's problems. It is a major economic problem. The food processing after the family, 80% is done by women with charcoal and firewood. 90% of our population rely on charcoal and firewood. It's killing the forests. It's killing people. It's, the smoke is a carcinogen. We have experts who are here to integrate that into the planning process. And I know the World Bank already did a workshop two weeks ago. Gender and youth, of course, the Just Energy Transition Plan is about wealth creation. It's about growth. It's about development. That is also climate resilient. So we'll ensure those elements are built into the plan. We've invited our friends from Kenya because His Excellency the President joined President Ruto, the only president, to launch an innovative financing locally led climate action program in Kenya. First of its kind, backed by many, many laws, a consortium of laws, as a new approach to taking climate action right to the local government level. And Your Excellency, Mr. President, I'm pleased to inform you that the Paramount Chiefs came in full force. We've invited the Council of Paramount Chiefs, the Paramount Chief, Chief MPs. We've invited all the, the district council chairs and the CAs, and also all our colleague MPs in the various committees and in various local governments. So they're here in full force. And we're very grateful at this point. I want to give our deep appreciation to the special envoy from Kenya, uh, Ali Mohammed. Ambassador Ali Mohammed came with a big contingent of seven people. Mr. President, since we came back from Kenya, has been asking where they come. <laughs> Mr. President, I'm pleased to tell you, he came with his team last time. So we'll work on climate, uh, locally led climate action program to replicate this new innovation in Kenya, which the World Bank wants to replicate across the world. We'll have, and we have here a good team from the International Renewable Energy Agency. Mr. President met with uh, Sultan El Java and the team from the UAE, but also in New York, he authorized the Minister of Environment and myself to participate in the dinner and I moderated that session as part of the UNGA. And they're here full force, Mr. President, 
This is a, a program to launch a billion dollar initiative at COP28, and we're very grateful that we've been included as part of the pilot, but you were also part of launching the accelerated partnership for renewables in Africa. So they sent it to the team to begin to work with us to formulate that. Next slide. This dialogue is about possibilities. It's about harnessing possibilities. I'll just give you a quick shot, but the Minister of Energy will give you the details. We already know, Mr. President, this is a clear pipeline we have. We have Serengeti, 20 megawatts, renewable. Fully functional, hopefully, 2024, the testing systems. I'm putting pressure now on the Serengeti CEOs over here. By the way, Mr. President, we have CEOs in here from mining, big mining companies. We have CEOs here who are now building solar systems in the country. So it's a dialogue that will involve the private sector. We have the World Bank Group. They've already indicated to us that anywhere from 40 to 70 megawatts of solar can be installed within 18 months if we take the right steps on the policy side. So President will talk about these ambition and targets. But Mr. President, I wanted to lay the foundation for people to see that your targets and goals and ambition are not based on fiction. They're based on what we know we've done and the necessity to remove the barriers so we implement and we drive action. These are just an indication. If you add those up very quickly, you're looking at 700 megawatts. The ambition is very clear. Let the president tell you what he's doing is for the country. But again, we emphasize, in all countries that have been successful, been done over 20, 30 years. You don't politicize energy. So with a plan that will, that will eventually be presented by the president within the year, you will see where we're headed. So this dialogue will continue. Out of it will come work streams. We are looking at partners. You say, join us on this journey. Many actions are on the ground. How do we build coherence, even amongst agencies, to support these various work streams and to support Feed Salon and the Economic Development Plans of His Excellency the President. At this juncture, that was to set the scene, why we're here and where we're headed. I also want to take note that we asked Madam First Lady to join us specifically for a good purpose. She's leading a number of work streams for the United Nations, on women's issues, on children's issues. But the relevance here today is the zero waste. She's been chosen by the Secretary General of the UN to join an eminent group of individuals to lead zero waste. Zero waste means environmental, sustainable production and consumption, and recycling and the whole circular economy. So, Madam, we're very grateful that you gave us time to come, and we hope we can also support that global platform that you will be leading. At this point, then, I want to invite the Minister of Energy, Al Haji Kanja Sisi, who is on a very good absent, but he made sure he left a recorded message to send the scene. The video for Honorable Kanja. Excellencies, colleague ministers, distinguished guests, permit me to acknowledge all existing protocols. Good morning. Let me start by apologizing for my absence to welcome you in person for reasons completely outside my control. Thank you for gathering here today at the first National Climate Resilience and Energy Transition Dialogue in Sierra Leone. It is an honor to address you as Minister of Energy, and I am deeply committed to the cause that brings us together today by charting a cause towards sustainable, resilient, and the energy efficient future for our nation. Our objectives are clear to develop a just and inclusive energy transition plan 
at the climate resilient agriculture and food systems transformation transformation strategy in alignment with our government's development ambitions. This is not just a national mission. It is our moral duty to address the intertwined challenges of climate change, low energy access, subsistence agriculture, unemployment, and high levels of poverty. And the energy sector has a pivotal and even role to play in achieving these objectives. Let me start by highlighting a fundamental need in our energy sector, digital power. The reliability of our energy supply is crucial for the growth and development of our nation. While renewable energy sources are vital for reducing our carbon footprint and increasing energy access, we must also ensure a stable, consistent supply of power to meet the increasing energy demands of our growing economy. To address this need, our strategy involves a multi-pronged approach. A, diversification of energy sources. We will explore a diverse range of energy sources including hydro, thermal, and renewables to provide a well-balanced mix of basic and intermittent power sources. This diversity not only ensures stability, but also contributes to our climate goals. B, investment in modern infrastructure. We will invest in modern infrastructure and green management systems that can efficiently handle base load power sources while integrating intermittent renewables seamlessly. C. Engagement with international partners to secure the necessary funding and, expert and expertise for these initiatives. We will actively engage with international partners, multilateral organizations, and private investors who are eager to support Sierra Leone's energy transition and transformation. The capacity building and training. Our strategy also includes a significant emphasis on capacity building and training for our workforce. Developing the skills needed to operate and maintain the diversified energy sector is vital for its long-term success. But our approach to energy transition and transformation doesn't stop at the need for baseload power. We also recognize the imperative to increase the efficiency of utilities. And we understand that private sector intervention can be a powerful catalyst in achieving this goal. We will appreciate your sharing of experiences on this. Our strategy for enhancing utility efficiency includes A, public-private partnerships. We are actively seeking opportunities to form partnerships with the private sector to manage, upgrade, to manage, upgrade, and operate our utilities more efficiently. This approach not only brings in expertise but also incentivizes innovation. B, regulatory frameworks. We are committed to establishing trans transparent and stable regulatory frameworks that encourage private sector participation. These frameworks will provide clear rules of engagement and protect the interests of all stakeholders, including the public. Including the public. C, technology integration. Embracing cutting edge technologies is essential to improve the efficiency of utilities. We will encourage the adoption of smart grid technologies, data analytics, and digital solutions to enhance service, <coughs> service delivery and reduce energy losses. 
the customer-centric services. Our utilities must be customer-centric. We aim to improve the quality of services, reduce downtime, and ensure affordability for all. Private sector involvement will drive innovation and customer-focused improvements. In conclusion, as we embark on this journey towards a sustainable, resilient, and energy-efficient future, let us remember that our success hinges on the collaboration of all stakeholders, government, international partners, the private sector, and most importantly, the people of Sierra Leone. We must remain committed to a just and an inclusive transition, one that ensures that the benefits of our efforts are shared by all. I thank you for your dedication to the cause and for your participation in this very critical dialogue. Together, we can create a brighter, more sustainable future for scenario. Again, I welcome you all to this dialogue. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, we, we thank His Excellency Raji Kanja Sisi for his welcoming remarks. We now recognize Honorable Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Mr. Jiu Abdullah. Excellency, the African Economic Outlook 2022 main report has indicated clearly that the African continent is warming faster than the global average over land and ocean, and Sierra Leone is no exception. According to the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, current predictions are that critical global warming levels are likely to be reached earlier than mid-century in Africa. Sierra Leone is vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change despite its low level of emissions, with a growing number of people at risk to extreme events and significant impacts on the economy. Climate change threatens food security and the livelihoods of most of the population in Sierra Leone. Changes in precipitation and temperature increase, risks of droughts, floods, rise in sea levels affect the country's agriculture, water, energy, infrastructure, and coastal areas. The regional climate models for Africa predict increased temperature and highly variable rainfall levels, both of which require adaptation in agriculture practices and production. Food production, particularly rice and farmer livelihoods, are susceptible to the various variations in precipitation levels, given that rice is a staple food crop and grown mainly on small boulder farms under rain-fed conditions, particularly in Sierra Leone. This vulnerability is as a result of extreme rural poverty and affects farmers with no insurance to protect their farm products against severe weather events, or have capital to invest 
in irrigation and other technologies to adapt to the varying rainfall levels. Sierra Leone's high dependence on rain-fed agriculture exacerbates our vulnerability to climate change. So climate impact also is expected to increase the incidence of pests and animal diseases that will be difficult to manage. Ladies and gentlemen, in a bid to address the highlighted challenges, governments of Sierra Leone created a strong linkage between climate vulnerability, development, mainstream climate change, into the national development agenda. The medium term National Development Plan 2019 to 2023 emphasized the need for aligning environmental, climate, and economic development plans in order to stage proactive efforts to mitigate the causes of global warming. The country's policy response to climate change is this engagement aligns with the efforts of the Ministry to continue the mainstreaming of climate change into the national development agenda, particularly the 2024-2030 medium-term <coughs> national development plan. We must stress the need for aligning environment, climate, and economic development plans in order to stage proactive efforts to mitigate the causes of global warming. Your Excellency, leveraging nature's technology has to be a part of the solution to addressing climate change. Sierra Leone is blessed with nature's technology for carbon sequestration. The Upper Guinea forests, which run through Sierra Leone, are one of the planet's major lungs. The mangroves along the west coast of the country are super efficient at carbon sequestration. These terrestrial forests and wetlands have been providing our carbon sequestration while also protecting the assets that provide these valuable services. Over the next few months, we will engage local representatives from the councils to the chiefdoms on how we can work together to protect these assets and the shared benefits of doing so. It is my hope that we will take the following as key factors in setting a plan for just an inclusive energy transition in the context of climate resilience and food systems transformation. One, we must strengthen the economic and policy instruments to incentivize climate positive actions and discourage harmful activities such as deforestation, illegal and unsustainable mining activities and illegal fishing practices. These instruments should encourage climate positive investments by offering financial and other incentives to domestic and international investors. We should also look at removing barriers to investments, especially those that incentivize our domestic investors. They should also aim to reduce harmful activities, strengthen monitoring and enforcement of laws and regulations. Such instruments could include pricing of our natural, nat natural resources that reflect their true economic value, penalties for destructive and degrading activities, improved and more efficient forest management practices, tax credits for certain types of businesses, including clean energy, climate smart agriculture inputs, recycling, composting, and clean waste incineration, 
UC waivers on equipment needed for agriculture adaptation, clean energy, and disaster mitigation. Governments should scale up resource mobilization through global climate funds for support of large scale mitigation and adaptation programs. Domestic resource mobilization should also be encouraged, tailored to the country's specific priorities, such as credit facilities for households to purchase cleaner cook stoves, loan programs to support farmer-based organizations to invest in new irrigation technologies, or seeds adapted to the warmer temperatures, or grant programs to support reforestation activities. We must take advantage of the South-South cooperation and other partnerships to introduce new technology for clean and efficient energy production, climate smart agriculture, environmental monitoring, resilient infrastructure, and other initiatives. The private sector can play a pivotal role in scaling up technology government can use policy and economic instruments to encourage private sector investment. All government ministries and MBAs must mainstream climate change in their work. This should extend to energy, agriculture, health, education, social services, disaster management, and others. Civil society, private sector, international partners must be encouraged and motivated to act and respond to climate challenges. As I conclude, I must reiterate that our lives and livelihoods are at risk because of the impacts of climate change on our farmers, our food security, and infrastructure. Everyone here today should be concerned about this dangerous menace. Making a clarion call to all participants present here to be candid and provide their invaluable contributions over the next few days. Let me use this opportunity to thank His Excellency the President of the Republic for making climate change a government priority and my able chairman of the Presidential Initiative on Climate Change, Renewable Energy, and Food Security, and other partners for organizing this dialogue. Mm -hmm. Let me assure you my ministry's commitment to the course. Climate change is factual. It is at our doorstep and the most pressing threat facing our vulnerable communities. We must work collectively to address the vulnerabilities and stop procrastinating. I thank you all for your attention. We will stop procrastinating and we will take action under your leadership. Mm -hmm. We recognize the Honorable Minister of Finance, Mr. Sheku A.F. Bangor. Chairman, Your Excellency, Madam First Lady, Chief Minister, Ministers of Government, Members of Parliament, Parliament Chief, Chiefs present here, local government leaders, partners in development, uh, Special Envoy from Kenya, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of this dialogue, particularly in short. Um, difficult times, tumultuous time, where the world is experiencing adverse um, climate changes, uh, coupled with increasing poverty. As aptly put by the UN Secretary General, countries must work to break the cycle of poverty disaster by honoring Paris Agreement, but also striving to achieve sustainable development by implementing the Sunday framework on disaster and risk reduction. Uh, 
I'm here fully aware that the Ministry of Finance is, is critical in supporting the and resolving all these interconnected challenges of climate and employment poverty, uh, as well as the need to realize in the ambition of energy transition within the context of climate resilience and the need uh, to have uh, food systems that are transformative. Uh, so my ministry understands that securing the necessary investment in resources is an imperative to addressing all of these challenges effectively. So the transition to clean energy and the transformation of our food systems require not only sound planning, uh, but also significant financial commitments. Uh, it is not a mistake that His Excellency the President, within the context of climate and uh, response to climate challenges, identified Feed Salon as a key development objective that will be supported by technology, but also sustainable infrastructure among a big five uh, priorities that he has set. So to that end, I am very pleased um, to announce that in the ministry we have been proactive uh, to facilitate the mobilization of resources by establishing a climate finance unit in the Ministry of Finance. And that unit is to serve as a dedicated hub to harness um, the institutions uh, that hold custody to our, our respective uh, assets. It could be climate assets, it could be other assets that are relevant to supporting sustainable investments that are climate uh, resilient. It could be the blue economy, it could be you know, mining resources, it could be our forests, it could be our mangroves. These resources have to be harnessed in a way uh, through the Ministry of Finance for supporting these other agencies to ensure that we are ready to uh, invest in each of those infrastructure that are sustainable uh, to the environment. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> aside of that, um, we have what we have done. I'm pleased to outline about six points where I see the ministry supporting uh, this transformation agenda. First uh, is mobilization of investment. Uh, at the heart of the energy transition plan is the need to secure sustainable investments. Uh, we recognize the importance of financial partnership for attracting both domestic but also international capital to fund projects, including those focused on whether it's sustainable energy, agriculture, but also other infrastructure that I needed. Uh, through targeted outreach and collaboration with our international partners, we aim to secure the investment necessary for, su for successfully implementing this plan that we developed. The private sector is key. And so on the second point, we want to ensure that um, we do understand that the private sector is a, is a main driver of growth uh, and innovation in countries. And so by actively involving the private sector, we can leverage uh, their balance sheets and their resources, expertise, but also technology to accelerate the transition that will be developed, the transition plan that will be developed. Uh, and, and the idea is to scale up uh, in the energy space, as you heard from the minister, uh, is that we, the country is, is uh, based energy early, is, is, is large on the neighbor, especially on the hydro space. But to scale up uh, our interventions in the hydro space, so also in the solar space in the country, and reduce your minimizing uh, our excessive reliance on fossil fuel in the country. I think that is feasible, and it is important that we are able to step forward in that space in the private sector. Private finance, third, is an area where I think the dialogue has to shift. Most of what has been happening in Africa is that our countries will have not been aligned to understanding the fact that we are green in Africa, like the green sub-Saharan Africa. So we are big sequestering hub for the emission that is out there in the world. Now, that's the asset. It's an asset that we have, and that asset has to be harnessed. So in Sierra Leone, the discussion had been, uh, let's see exactly how we package these assets. Package the assets in a way uh, that we will be able to mobilize the kind of resources required for us to invest in the climate and sustainable uh, infrastructure or sustainable uh, uh, investment. And I will tell you, for example, 
uh, climate assets that are in the Ministry of Environment. Um, like the Minister was saying, our mangroves, our, our terrestrial forests, or even in the agricultural space, where we are seeing some of the private sector. I give you an example of Myro. They are planting fast growing trees. Those trees are sequester hubs. For what? For climate sensitive climate emissions. And they are actually mobilizing climate carbon credits of them. And these carbon credits are actually traded internationally. We want to be able to scale that up in the country. But as a custodian of the assets, to work with the Ministry of Finance to do what? Establish the institutional architecture, policy, and regulations that can allow us to build the credibility internationally to be able to trade those assets when they are properly harvested. So we will work with you, uh, the Ministry of, 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 of Environment, to do what? To ensure that we are able to audit any of those assets or new ones that are being developed, get them certified, get them registered, and marketed in the international markets and traded for carbon credits, bringing resources into the state. That is where the space is, and that's the discussion we want to have with partners that are engaging with us. And I think we are ready to make the space available for those kind of investments in Sierra Leone. Partnership was actually spoken about, Your Excellency. It's the fourth point. It is imperative that our efforts are inclusive, involving all stakeholders. It could be our ministries, departments, and agencies, our communities, so that they understand their own role in ensuring that they protect the environment itself, but are able to harness alternative livelihood from that protection. Uh, we'll have civil society and the private sector to support us in this space. Yeah. So we'll engage the broad range of stakeholders in all efforts to build strong coalition, foster innovation, and facilitate rapid and effective implementation of this plan once it is developed. And we will also collaborate with our bilateral and regional partners to promote knowledge sharing, align our national priorities, and drive progress on key development challenges in advancing the plan implementation. Fifth, I'll speak about fiscal incentive and our responsibility. We are very much committed in ensuring that we develop fiscal incentive for investments that are climate resilient or climate sensitive in that will support the transition plan as well. And we are also careful, uh, going to be very careful in managing the resources that are enhanced or also, uh, mobilized uh, in this space to be able to support uh, the program that will be developed in the plan. Lastly, it's about risk issue. Uh, we understand that there are risks associated with green investments as well. So we will develop the risk mitigation strategies and financial instruments uh, to, the, to the concerns that will be raised um, along the implementation of this plan to support, uh, 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 to support the plan implementation. Let me conclude, Mr. Um, Chairman. I know the road ahead is challenging, but together uh, we can overcome these challenges and be able to build a, a very sustainable, resilient, and inclusive future for Sierra Leone. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share with us. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We recognize Honorable Madam Kenya Bali, Minister of Planning and Economic Development. Yeah. Excellency, the President of the Republic of Serbia, Dr. Julius Tabio, the First Lady of the Republic of Serbia, and I stand on all existing protocols. It is indeed gratifying for me to be here at this event this morning, which signifies a huge advantage, an advancement and frontier shift in our ambition to have climate resilient and sustainable energy and food systems and strategies for a self-resilient cerebral. In the context of ongoing multiple and interlocking crises in engulfing the world, sustainable critical thinking and programming in the areas of climate change, energy, and food systems cannot be overemphasized. I would therefore like to congratulate the Chairman of the Presidential Initiative on Climate Change, Renewable Energy, and Food Security, Dr. Kenzo Lunkala, and commend the manner in which his office has worked with relevant government institutions, of which my ministry is 
as well as development partners to bring this dialogue to fruition. We are particularly grateful for the timing of this dialogue, which is taking place whilst my ministry is in the process of assiduously developing the successor medium-term national development plan, for which the outlook of the output of this dialogue is extremely your Excellency, generally addressing climate, energy, and food system resilience issues has been central in our national development planning discourse of Serbia over the past five years. As articulated in the current medium term development plan, 2019 to 2023, I can assure you, Your Excellency, that the successor medium-term national development plan, we will also give greater prominence to the climate change issue. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as many of you already know, the successor plan mm -hmm. that I refer to is currently being developed with the big five game changers at its core. Feed Salon, Human Capital Development, Youth Employment Scheme, Technology and Innovation, and also revamping of the public service. But what is important for us to note at this meeting is that climate change and environment stand out as one of the four strategically identified enablers supporting the big five game changes medium-term development plan under formulation. Therefore, we ascribe a distinct prominence to building environmental resilience and minimizing the vulnerabilities of climate change. In addition, for each of the five, the, the big five great game changes, there will be climate-related activities. For instance, Feet Salon, this purpose strategy to develop Finance smart agriculture. Under human capital development, strategies for prevent, prevention and mitigation of the effects of environmental factors on the health of the population, especially in the children. Within the youth employment scheme, game changer, the promotion and the use of energy efficient technology for youth enterprises would be a key intervention strategy. Under technology and infrastructure, the technology and infrastructure game changer. Planned intervention will aim at fully unlocking what Sierra Leone has in abundance renewable energy, resource potential, and as a digital solution. Energy efficiency solutions for women will also be included. Mr. President, in addition, we expect that the discussion today and tomorrow will underpin the development of a comprehensive climate financing strategy. Underscoring the fact that in the last couple of years, we have witnessed enormous multi-stakeholder interest and efforts in climate-related financing at both institutional and operational levels, in the public and private sectors, including the participation of non-governmental organizations. The climate financing strategy should target private sector mobilization international institutions and partnerships, a blend of financial instruments as well as innovative finance. Additionally and accordingly, my ministry recently in collaboration with UNDP and 20 new economy related government institutions has put together a new economy strategy, accompanied by a recently validated, as recent as last week, action plan to advance the optimal harnessing of our numerous ocean-related resources. With all these developments, I'm heartened that the future for Serenia is quite bright as we focus on the goal of consolidation of gains and acceleration, accelerating transformation of our nation. With these brief remarks, Mr. Chair, the Excellency, let me want to get and thank all who contributed towards making this epic-making event possible. 
We look forward to the output of deliberations over the next couple of days, so as to further enrich the narrative of the new Serbia Medium Term National Development Plan 2024 to 2030, and even beyond for the Serbia we want by 20. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Thank you for your leadership in developing the next five-year development plan for the country. We recognize Honorable Dr. Henry Musa Taka, Minister of Agriculture and Food Security. Thank you, Mr. Chair. His Excellency the President, uh, retired from the engineers, Mara Bio, His Excellency the First Lady, uh, Chief Minister, please allow me to um, stand on existing protocols. Um, exactly a week ago, His Excellency the President launched the Feed Salon Program, which is an all of government approach to helping to grow our economy, create jobs for our youth, revitalize uh, rural areas, solve uh, chronic food insecurity, malnutrition among our children, um, and to build our economy and set it on a firm footing for not only today, but the future. Obviously, if you've looked at uh, headlines from around the world, you will know that to do this is his flagship for the next uh, five years. I think geopolitical uh, conflicts, uh, the COVID crises, the fact that the people that we uh, import food from every now and then are making policies that, that would mean we are at their mercy, that our tummies and our economies can be held hostage. Um, it's primarily one of the main reasons why uh, His Excellency decided that for us in Sierra Leone, we must do everything we can to change that narrative for the next five years. Another compelling reason is the fact that Sierra Leone, despite us being a very uh, minimal uh, a meter of greenhouse gases and contribution contributor to climate change impact, we are very, very much at risk of the tremendous um, damages that climate change can cause. And agriculture and farming systems are at risk. And, and for that reason, it is also an imperative that we develop our food system to respond to not only our needs of today, but for the needs of our children um, yet unborn. And so in the Feed Salon program, there's a whole pillar that we've dedicated to uh, climate change and resilience. In that program, it deals with um, making sure our climate smart agriculture is included. We make sure we respond to farmers who, by not their own fault, will feel the brunt of uh, the effects of climate change that will respond by providing insurance um, to them when they, after having done all the hard work, um, suffer crop failure as a result of climate change. In that program, we believe um, water management systems, where extra irrigation um, is a central part of what we do because it allows us um, to produce more, when we produce more, we are more to feed. We also want to reduce our waste, our post harvest losses. When we do that, we can lean less on the environment for the same quantity of food and um, uh, activities that we generate from the sector. The Feed Salon program, as I mentioned, is an all of government approach. Um, energy, cheap energy, and uh, clean energy is a central part of that. And so, Part of what we've done is identify um, production zones and identify energy needs and infrastructure needs 
in those areas. And there, it's so that we have energy that would, um, if, if, a, if a private sector wants to set up a processing plant, uh, links to the production processes, that there is that energy that it can use. Um, if, if somebody wants the road that link it from the production center to market, we want to make sure that that's, that road is provided in the, in, uh, through the FITSA program. To do just that, His Excellency um, um, also uh, established a presidential council for the delivery of FITSA loan. This is a council where he, that he chairs and that has all other MDAs and private sector uh, and civil society that will come together to escalate precisely these types of problems um, to deliver on things alone. And so we are uh, very excited to be part of the dialogue today. I think this, the, the, the output of this work um, feeds directly into some of the institutional arrangements that we already have um, to be able to deliver on things alone. It's a, it's a very important piece of work. I think the nexus between energy, climate change, and agriculture is excellency already identified, and uh, we congratulate the chairman um, for steering um, and bringing us all together to be able to build, um, even as we, we plan and deliver for pizza Road. I want to thank you very much for your attention, um, and let me assure you that pizza Road again, it's all of government approach. It's one where the, we, we, we we want to be the, the engine for growth, for creating jobs, for making sure we're not only building for today, but for tomorrow. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. to round up this initial contributions by our collaborating ministries, we invite Dr. Austin Denby, Minister of Health and Sanitation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, His Excellency, the President, retired Brigadier Dr. Julius Malavio, First Lady of the Republic, Excellency Dr. Basana uh, Malavio, uh, distinguished guests, Mr. Chairman, may I respectfully ask to stand on existing protocols. I think it's really great to have this dialogue today. But sitting there as the Minister of Health and hearing all of these issues, we know the adage in Sierra Leone, well body. All these issues end up if we don't manage them. So the issues of the climate, the issues of the environment, the issues of energy are so critical to we, who we are as, as a ministry. We're very pleased that His Excellency has this distinct vision uh, of the Big Five, and built into that is this essential component of human capital development that has not been lost. It's very deep into that. It's a foundation for it. And we think that the health component of it is so very, very critical as we move forward. We um, know that the fundamental principle for us is ensuring universal health coverage. His Excellency you remind us every day that everybody matters. All seven and a half, eight million of us matter and our health counts. And so there has to be a deliberacy in mitigation actions as well as preventive actions. Let me just take, for example, the fact that you have been so positive and direct in investing in the health sector that we're beginning to see the systemic changes that are yielding dividends. For example, we were able to drop maternal mortality by 60%, the best performing country in the continent in the same period of time. We've seen fundamental shifts in our vaccination coverage in this country. All of these are not by accident. It's because of the deliberacy of your work, His Excellency. So for us, when we start talking about um, the environment and climate change, let's just take
take the energy requirement as a good example. For us to be able to provide the good quality health care for every Sierra Leonean in this country, we want to be assured of an incredible source of energy for our hospitals, for our primary health care units, for our clinics, for the remote sites. This is vital. At this point in time, we have three major sources of energy. Number one is the grid. And you all know that um, there's a lot going on. Honorable Kanta has done incredibly well for us. But if you have a baby that depends on electricity for their breathing as, as a, a critical neonate, you have to have electricity all the time, every time, not sometimes. So we're grateful for the advancement that's been made in the grid system. We have backup systems using generators. The generators will be turned on to provide energy, but you know the climate implications of that. And not only that, the cost implications of it. In some cases, the cost of running a 100 kVA generator is nearly 20, 30% of the cost of the hospital's budget. So clearly, that's a temporary solution. What we're looking at is the renewable energy solutions that are accounting for Right now, a very small percentage, but we want to grow that. We want to grow that considerably. We want to be able to have energy available, accessible, all the time, every time, and we see good examples of that. His Excellency, we could not have asked for a better time for this dialogue. For the people of Sierra Leone, we want to be actively involved at every stage in these discussions and have our contributions as we are poised in the health sector to transform the health care system, the delivery system of this country to something that you will be proud of, I'll be proud of, our children, our grandchildren, the next generation will be proud of. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Minister of Health. We deliberately put you last so that you bring the human element particularly also the gender element. I just wanted to make sure Madam First Lady realizes we did not forget that as well. <laughs> um, we now turn to our international partners. It is an honor for me to invite Dr. Babatu Deramonsi, UN Resident Coordinator. Thank you for hosting us also last week. Uh, the whole team hosted us. Thank you very much, sir. We look forward to greater cooperation. You have the floor. Distinguished Chairperson, Your Excellency, the Chair Premier, Dr. Julius Madabio, President of the Republic of Sierra Leone, Your Excellency, Madam First Lady, Chief Minister, please permit me to stand on existing protocol in the interest of time. May I, on behalf of the UN country team, express our happiness at participating in this first national dialogue to initiate the processes for developing a just and inclusive energy transition plan for Syria and a climate resilient agriculture and food system transformation strategy in line with the government's development aspirations and plans. Climate action features prominently among the 17 sustainable development goals adopted by UN member states in 2015 as part of Agenda 2030, the universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Climate action is the focus of SDG 13, but Agenda 2030 emphasizes the interlinkages with the other 16 SDGs, since sustainable shared prosperity largely depends on environmental sustainability. In this regard, the UN country team applauds Mr. President's decision to add 
Climate Change, through the name and mandate of the Ministry of Environment, and to appoint a presidential advisor for climate change, renewable energy, and food security. These are important steps towards realizing objectives outlined in the country's key climate documents, including the nationally determined contributions, which highlight climate impacts in several sectors, including agriculture and food security, environment and natural resources, marines and fisheries, infrastructure, disaster preparedness and management, water resources and sanitation, and public health. It is clear to me from the well-crafted agenda of this first National Climate Resilience and Energy Transition Dialogue that one positive development that is likely to be generated by the Presidential Initiative on Climate Change, Renewable Energy and Food Security is a shift in policy mindset towards integrated approaches that simultaneously address at scale several development challenges such as renewable energy interventions that directly link with improved agro-processing operations or irrigation infrastructures that not only support climate smart agriculture but also support reforestation, hydroenergy generation and expansion of access to safe drinking water. This policy approach is an absolute necessity in the prevailing context of significant financial resource constraints and the urgent need to accelerate progress towards the attainment of national development priorities and the SDGs. It is our hope that this dialogue will also help move the country further up the pathway for developing bankable projects and programs that enable it to use its impressive natural assets, be they forests, the agricultural assets, the bountiful water resources, biodiversity, and solar endowments. These assets can be used to access the large and growing streams of international climate finance facilities and opportunities, including green bonds, carbon credit markets, blue bonds, and debt or nature swaps. We know from the recent successes of Gabon, Rwanda, and Kenya, stakeholders, including government, the development partners, civil society organizations, and the private sector on the deployment of public-private partnerships to redirect public and private investment towards sustainable projects and climate-friendly business models, especially in high-impact sectors such as extractives, energy, other kinds of infrastructure, especially transport infrastructure, and agriculture. Finally, Mwangi, Country Manager SMLU, the World Bank. And thank you very much for the collaboration with your team. Your Excellency, Mr. Dr. Julius Marabio, Madam First Lady, Excellency Fatima Bio. Chief Minister, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to the government for putting this dialogue together. I'll focus on a few things, Your Excellency. You see, in that couple of weeks, I'll be on off from what Madam Barrett mentioned. Your Excellency, I think for me to break the cycle of development challenges we face is when we see a national medium development plan that cuts across electro cycles. 
And I think it's one thing we had last week from Madame Bele, Madame Bele, that the National Development Plan will transcend political cycles. This is huge, and I commend you and congratulations to the government because when we want to talk about institutional sustainability, capacity building systems, they will have to go beyond one political cycle. Yeah. Whether it is the ruling government or the opposition, having a blueprint that people will read and continue the trajectory of development is what sets some countries apart, Kenya in particular. So congratulations, Your Excellency, and we look forward to supporting that moment. Um, <clears throat> turning to climate change, local action, I happen to have lived in Kenya for seven years. And the whole notion of local climate action was a part and parcel of the work that we are doing. When Kenya embarked on the ambitious devolution program, climate action was not part of that. We started with the ambitious devolution support program to help the government accelerate and roll out devolution. Ten years later, the established county governments came to realize that you cannot have a significant impact on climate change unless if you embed climate action into local led action. And one famous example is Narok County, where during the rainy season, Narok City is in the low lying valley. It would rain and property houses are destroyed simply because the problem is happening upstream. And because it was happening upstream, we kept focusing on our development interventions to mitigate, master plan, whatever, we are part of the problem. Doing master plans downstream, but the problem was happening elsewhere. Until we came to a realization that unless we put a focus to rain land management upstream, where we also push on downstream, is the only way we are going to have an impact on climate change. And that's hence the development of the local climate action in Kenya that the Kenyan colleagues will talk about. Moving here in Sierra Leone, I think it will have In that context, we have begun a dialogue with the Minister of Environment. Um, we would like to see that Sierra Leone is part and parcel of the Upper Guinea Forest, for which Gabon, uh, Ghana, Liberia, and I can be part of as part of the regional project. This is one way through which we will be able to contribute to harness the natural capital within the region. We are talking with the Minister of Finance on supporting the climate finance strategy. And I think that will go a long way in spearheading efforts to help on climate change. Your Excellency, turning to energy very briefly, I think two years ago you made a commitment of accelerating private sector participation in energy. But I think that process has been slow, and we really need your help. Having a turnaround of EDSA will require operational efficiency for us to cut down the technical and commercial losses from 40% where we are. You made a commitment that you would like to see private sector participation, and this does not mean that the assets of PEPSA are going away. The assets will remain the assets of the government. But it's the operational efficiency that will actually bring about the turnaround of the utility. And we are happy to support that process together with bringing a chief operating officer who will help in the process of really turning around. But we've also seen huge significant developments in the energy space, which I would like to highlight. One is that just over a little, one year ago, the Vice President, the Minister of Finance, engaged the Cote d'Ivoire government, and were able to bring the power line from the CLSG. CLSG is today providing power at a cost of 20, 35% lower than what we are getting at Kapawa. And because of the CLSG line, we are able to augment the current supply of power, and I think that's part of the energy transition we excellence. The other one is the respite, the regional solar and emergency power. 
As we speak now, we have 40 companies that have completed the submission of bidding. Your Excellency, in the next Energy Roundtable, what we want to promise you is that a farm has been selected to deliver the 40 megawatts of power. We hope by February to have the Energy Roundtable. But what we hope to see is that out of the 40 companies that have expressed the expression of interest to do the execution of both Lungi and the Newton, is that within the next 12 months, we are 18 months, we are able to see solar energy come on board. Turning to off grid, we are working with UNOPS under the SD project to make sure that 200 health centers do have reliable solar power. That's all we have. In addition to that, is 500 primary schools, second primary and secondary schools, also to receive solar power. This is also happening now. So I think we are seeing strategy and strikes towards really enabling that. But we are also mindful of the challenges in the energy sector, and we are working with partners, MCC, EU, and FCD, and others, to really that we come to a realization of the risk cost plan in energy. It's doable, and we will get there with all your support and commitment. Finally, on food security, uh, no, before I talk about food security, one thing uh, on about your service I would like to point out is that we've been engaging with the Minister of, of Environment, and one key attribute I really like about what he has said every time we meet is I want to serve as a platform to coordinate and accelerate delivery, which I think is a key principle we would like to see others emulate and push forward. Because it is not just one person's responsibility, but I think putting all our hands on deck is only when we are, being, we are going to see a change happen. Right now, we have approval to put the first central landfill for Freetown. The Minister of Defense gave us land. We've had over one year getting the, the, the land compliance and everything sorted. But for us to realize the central landfill and the transfer stations will require a coordination between the line ministries involved and the Minister of Environment and Volunteer to post this. This is a spirit that at least we will need to see your Excellency in trying to push this agenda. On food security, again, I would like to commend the government on the launch of the Fit Salon um, strategy. We are behind the strategy in many ways and talking to the key players, Minister of Finance, Agriculture, Chief Minister, and others. And we truly believe that it's possible to turn around the page in terms of feeding salon. Feeding salon also, aquaculture is part of that, fishing is part of that. And we're engaging the Ministry of Fisheries to see that the narrative of fisheries is also turned around. Look at fisheries as a renewable and a strong factor in the fiscal. And up to until now, we've been not able to leverage the fiscal power of fisheries, yet it can actually help in the diversification of the economy beyond mining. And we do hope to optimize those uh, efforts altogether. I'll stop here, but once again, congratulations to the government for this wonderful dialogue and look forward to the next steps, actionable steps. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Abdul. The President heard you clearly and he already whispered in my ear, so I know Chief Minister and I, we have a lot of follow-up to do. The Minister of Finance also heard clearly, but we're very grateful for your frankness to us. That's what this dialogue is about. We are now recognizing Mr. Gulbruz Gonel, Director of Country Programs for the International Renewable Energy Agency. Thank you very much, Chairman, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be part of this dialogue and, and many thanks for inviting us. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is not on track with climate goals. I think it's very clear from the latest scientific reports as well as from the intergovernmental um, climate process. And renewables are central to this discussion, given that more than three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions they originate from our current fossil fuel based energy systems. And beyond, beyond the climate ambitions, we all felt and I think still feeling the adverse effects of the pandemic as well as the war in Ukraine on our ability to access to energy, health, food in an affordable and sustainable way. 
That's exactly where renewables come in as multiplier solution, offering the cheapest source for power and increasingly penetrating uh, and use sectors. Deployment is growing year on year on year, and last year over 80% of the um, additional capacity installed, they come from renewable energy. Nevertheless, renewable energy has never been only about deploying renewables. It is more than that, especially the ripple effect of energy transition on, um, on, on socioeconomics, on, on socioeconomic development, creating jobs, creating, stimulating economic activity and growth, improving welfare. I think these are extremely important dimensions. And uh, it is also about industrial development. Through creating larger economic values with renewables and also exploring opportunities for establishing industrial value chains around the minerals critical to energy transition. So if you are serious about climate, sustainable development, and energy security ambitions, this translates to do more, do faster with renewables. And we try to trigger a stronger global action around that. I'm currently working with the uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates co-presidency to secure leaders' pledge for triple invite Sierra Leone to uh, join us in Dubai at Dubai COP and sign up to this pledge and be part of that uh, global community. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is central to, the, to this discussion because it is only 2% of the global renewable energy investments that were made in Africa in the last two years. What we are seeing is rising ambition in the continent, but it is yet to translate into concrete investments, large investments on the ground. Clearly, more needs to be done, and ARENA is prepared to do more in Africa, especially with the two new um, uh, flagship programs that we have initiated, which are very relevant to the African and Sub-Saharan African context. The first one is, Advanced Partnership for Renewables in Africa, which was jointly launched by Excellencies President Bio and Kenyan Prince President Ruto at the African Climate Summit last month to work with countries with high renewables ambitions and support them in the realization of their own plans and programs for renewable-based energy transition and green industrialization. The partnership is driven by a cohort of African countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, Namibia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe, that will provide political vision and leadership for high renewables ambition and green industrialization to the continent, with the support from Germany, Denmark, UAE, the UAE, and other financial and technical partners under the coordination and facilitation of IRENA. The partnership offers a comprehensive strategy that focuses on three key areas of mobilizing finance to address large and structural gaps in renewables finance, providing technical assistance and capacity building that is country and context driven and tailored to national uh, specific needs, <laughs> and also engaging the private sector to achieve Necessary, necessary speed and scale. The partnership is for COP28 initiative on empowering Pakistan with renewables. That aims to catalyze systemic energy transformation of agri-food and health sectors, moving from the current piecemeal approach to transformation action, bringing scale and also banking on partnership rather than working on silos. This initiative put people 
at the center of action, fostering climate resilience of communities with climate mitigation of co benefits. And I will provide additional insights into this program later in the day. Ladies and gentlemen, Irina wishes to take the cooperation with Sierra Leone to the next level. And we are extremely pleased with having the country on board with both programs that will provide the necessary framework to do so. And I very much hope that uh, our joint efforts will greatly contribute to the ambitions of the country uh, for climate action, for uh, renewables, as well as for food security in the coming period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We hope to see you at COP28. We now invite His Excellency Ambassador Ali Daoud Mohammed, Senior Advisor to His Excellency President Ruto, and Special Presidential Climate Envoy of Kenya. Thank you, Chairman. Your Excellency President Julius Magabio, Your Excellency First Lady of Sierra Leone, Chief Minister, Honorable Ministers, Paramount Chiefs, Members of Parliament, Excellencies, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. It is indeed a great honor to be invited to speak on behalf of Kenya at this inaugural National Climate Resilience and Energy Transition Trial. From the outset, Your Excellency, Please accept the warm greetings and good message from our brother, President William Rutto. The President conveys his excellency and President Rutto is also grateful for your personal attendance at the inaugural after Planet Summit that was hosted by Kenya as you know. As you know, Your Excellency, the summit was massively successful because of the attendance and the attendance of many other leaders from Africa and beyond. The summit has since been celebrated and referenced in many fora, including the UN General Assembly and other global meetings. This first national climate and energy dialogue of Sierra Leone is a clear testimony that countries are taking forward the outcomes from the Africa Climate Summit. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, climate change has become the most pressing and existential challenge of our time. It is a threat that demands urgent collective action by all. The UN Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, the recent climate ambition summit in New York last month warned that humanity has opened the gates of hell. We are all witnessing the unprecedented impacts in every part of the globe, from wildfires, heat waves, droughts, desertifications, and deadly floods and mudslides, including here in Sierra Leone. The litany of the problem from climate change cannot be summed up. And the magnitude and frequency continues to overwhelm. to affect lives and livelihoods around the world, adapting to and mitigating its effects becomes critical. More than ever, it is urgent for countries to invest in green resilience. And it's precisely that agency for action that informed the Africa Climate Summit, which marked an important step in the continent's effort to tackle the challenge and advance a just and equitable transition. The African Climate Summit adopted an approach of turning the climate crisis into an opportunity. So the attainment of the prosperity of the continent while avoiding the carbon in 
some statistics, Africa's untapped renewable energy potential is over 50 times the world's electricity demand by 2040. And in terms of demography, Africa will be over 20% of the global labor force by 2050 and over 40% by the time of the century, 2100. Again, as we had earlier, two-thirds of all remaining arable land in the world is here in this continent. And Africa is home to 30% of the world's critical minerals, many of them are Moreover, our mangroves, peatlands, and forests are a key part of the world's last remaining lands and habitat for important biodiversity. Throughout the continent, projects are starting to take advantage of these opportunities, from regenerative agricultural practices and clean cooking solutions to industrial scale green agri and green fertilizer production. These projects are great examples of the opportunity for climate positive growth. However, this pathway is not inevitable. While the importance is widely recognized, Success requires implementation at scale, and that will mean coordinated action and commitments both within and outside the continent. Your Excellency, as President Ruto said, These are primarily the responsibility of African countries, whilst two are elements that require global collaboration. The two elements that are Africa's responsibility are one, the need to focus and structure economic and positive opportunities, developing and implementing supporting legislation and regulation. And we will have today from the different ministers that these are already taking place here in Sierra Leone. All these elements are firmly included in the Nairobi Declaration as African commitments. On the economic planning, the declaration states, and I quote, we commit to focus our economic development plans on climate positive growth, including expansion of just 
energy transitions and renewable energy generation for industrial activity, climate smart and restorative agricultural practices, and essential protection and enhancement of nature and biodiversity. On the enabling environment, the declaration states, and I quote, we commit to develop and implement policies, regulations, and incentives aimed at attracting local, regional, and global investments in green growth inclusive of green and circular economies. In Kenya, Your Excellency, we have made clear strikes with our renewable energy ambitions and commitments, also in our green hydrogen policy and in our carbon market regulations. I will later touch briefly on key successes in Kenya's energy journey to date. The two elements which require global collaboration can also be found in the Nairobi Declaration. These are one, appropriate and sufficient journey to 